everyone, and welcome to Manazoa Brewing, and welcome to your Saturday evening post week in review. My name is Chris Wakefield, and I am the marketing manager for the Saturday evening post. I'm Nicholas Gilmore. I'm a staff writer at the post. I'm Troy Brownfield, also staff writer. A lot to talk about this week. First of all, let me tell you that you can subscribe to the Saturday evening post for fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars gets you a one-year membership, six new issues of the post in print at your house every single year and full access to our online archive. You can explore 200 years of Saturday Evening Post history, cover to cover magazines, and a lot is in those magazines. 15 bucks a year. SaturdayEveningPost.com slash subscribe. Really easy, really fun. Go do it, please. Um, Troy, um, since if we were to make a graph of the amount of stories on our website about comic books, it would probably spike right around when you started working here, <laughs> and I'm guessing that's not a coincidence. The biggest name in comic books passed away this week, Stan Lee. That's right. Um, well, Stan is, if you had a Mount Rushmore of comics, it would be, Me? you know, Stan, yeah, Jack Kirby, uh, Siegel and Schuster, you know, the, the list is very, is very small, but... Um, more so than just a creator, he was a personality. Um, everybody knows Stan Lee when you say the name, and it's because he has kind of this personality and uh, reach that's extended far beyond being a writer of comics. Now, he did co-create a number of characters that everybody knows, like the Hulk, Spider-Man, um, the X-Men, the Avengers, and so forth. You know, he had a hand in all of those things. And, you know, in the 60s, he went to college campuses and hit the lecture circuit and became well known. And he worked on developing Marvel properties for animation in the '80s. And then, in recent years, you know, he's known for the cameos in all the various Marvel films and, and um, theme park rides. Yeah, and has become a uh, personality unto itself. So even very small children to very old people, you know, they all know who Stan Lee is. So even though he was 95, it was still a bit of a shock because when you have a person that's got a personality and an impact that that's you know, that big and, and wide, it's still going to come right. as a surprise. And I think it says a lot about his legacy that you saw all of these various people from many, many walks of life uh, offering tributes. The uh, six original movie Avengers took out a full-page ad in The Hollywood Reporter uh, thanking him for their, you know, for his contribution to their lives and career, which right. I think is a, is a really nice gesture. And, of course, when you talk about the writers and artists... Um, there's hardly anybody that wasn't influenced in some way by Stan or by some rule that he had, you know, about how you write comics and so forth. It's just Do you have any favorite comic book characters from Marvel in particular? Or? Um, you don't strike me as a comic book person, but you know I? who Stan Lee is, and you know who these characters are, right? Yeah. Um, I like Doctor Strange. Okay. Yep, that's Stan and Steve that's Ditko. Stan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah St Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Um who also together created Spider-Man, I mean, which is arguably probably one of the five, six most well-known fictional characters on the planet right. at this point. Um, you know, so he's going to, you're going to hear about Stan Lee for a long time after he's gone. It's not like he's gone away. He's just one of those people that's now going to kind of recede into legend and is just right. going to be, um, you know, accessible through the things that he created. Again, a big piece you have up online at SaturdayEveningPost.com. Another piece you had that came up this week was um, about 10, maybe Stan Lee could be a Thanksgiving <laughs> topic next week at Thanksgiving. Um, I kind of ruined that segue. Dang, I, ruined, I wasted my chance. You also have a piece coming up about, about 10 alternative topics for the Thanksgiving dinner table. Besides politics and those third rail issues that might make your uncle mad, what are some of the things we should be talking about that won't get us in trouble? Well, should be or... You know, things that won't get us in trouble. Um, so I feel like Nick is the kind of person who brings up all those issues you shouldn't talk about. Nick is that person like, no, let's talk about this. You are 100% correct. <laughs> We're going to talk about making soap. <laughs> talk about your article before we get in trouble. Basically, uh, you know, we, we looked at a lot of things that uh, end up do being small talk items. Like uh, maybe you have that one relative, like I did, who's really obsessed with directions. You know, where every, like, how did you get here, you know, from where you were coming and all of that. So, but, but also, you know, 
there, there are a lot of things that you talk about with family, like, um, you know, automotive care, escrow, and so forth. And the whole thing's done with, with a kids. lot of tongue-in-cheek, yeah, the kids. You know, it's easy to avoid conflict, when you, if you, especially if you have kids there. Like, how are the kids doing in school? You know, what are they doing? <laughs> oh, you know, so-and-so started walking. Show me. You know, it's a little bit easier to sometimes grease those conversational wheels right. than, you know, who'd you vote for or... You know, Do you have that kind of, like, at my family, Thanksgiving, nothing is off limits. We talk about everything, politics, religion, sex, whatever. Do you have that kind of a table at Thanksgiving, or is it Yeah, more? we just talk about sex the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, um, it's, we talk about politics quite a bit. Usually, um, I mean, hopefully a, a measured conversation about, right. you know, different uh, current events that are going well, on. Well, so because I've been at some Thanksgivings and with some families where, you can't say certain things because some uncle will get mad or it's too sensitive for grandma to hear or something like that. And like if you say Trump or Pelosi, it, the whole dinner just goes spiraling out of control. Yeah, all my grandparents are gone, so we just, you know, nothing. the Trump administration. We don't even play Euchre anymore. <laughs> Jen, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> something you are going to be talking about, post-ups. Yeah. What are post-ups? Um, well, it's postum. Postum. I'm sorry. There's no it's plural. A, yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a cereal beverage. Is it stop? A cereal beverage? Is it food? Is it drink? I mean, nobody knows. But uh, it was uh, the first product uh, released by uh, the post uh, postum company, or you know, Charles Post Post cereal. Um, who uh, the company of which is still around making cereals, but this was their first product released in 1895, and um, the Saturday Evening Post had a lot of um, advertisements for Postum back in the day. Um, Where could I see those ads? Like, if I wanted to explore that today, how could I do that? I think maybe you could look in our archives. They're yeah. all online. All of it, everything, cover to cover, even the ads. Anyway, sorry. Um, the, these ads were pretty uh, hostile towards coffee and uh, coffee <laughs> <laughs> like how terrible coffee big was. Big coffee, really look out. And um, Postum was supposed to be this uh, alternative that did not have caffeine. It was, you know, nutritious, um, very, I mean, gluten heavy, honestly, by today's standards. But, um, and so it was popular uh, among, um, you know, people who wanted to stop their kids from drinking coffee. Because that was a thing. Kids used to drink coffee a lot. They still do. I mean, yeah, maybe. But, um, maybe your kids. <laughs> My kid is not drinking coffee. <laughs> but, um, and so it was, you know, the whole uh, campaign was coffee's bad for kids. Give them Postum instead. They started making cereals. Postum was really popular during World War II with uh, coffee uh, rations. Right. And well, uh, it's What happened to the brand? It kind of fell away in the later 20th century, uh, but it is back. Someone brought Postum back. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the Post company, was, it's traded hands a lot. It went from, like, General Foods to Crafts and got spun off onto its own thing. But um, Kraft dropped uh, Postum entirely, and there were a lot of people online who used to drink it. Probably a lot of baby boomers would recognize Postum, maybe from their childhood. Um, a lot of people said, you know, hey, I really like to post them. I like to drink it. Um, we want this back. And so a couple in North Carolina have uh, uh, started producing post them again. Wow. They bought the trade trademark and everything from Kraft. And it's back for all of your food drink needs. You can look for Nick's piece over at SaturdayEveningPost.com. Now it's time for one of my favorite segments that we do occasionally. <laughs> it's <No>. called... <laughs> It's called Don't At Me. Uh, something during the week that might be uh, getting us, getting our backs up a little bit, annoying us a little bit. Troy, do you have anything that's getting on your nerves this week? You know, uh, this is um, goes with this time of year a little bit. And it's, I think that we start changing stores over for holidays too early. I mean, I know that that's uh, a common, common gripe. But, you know, pretty much we're going to have Easter stuff out before Christmas is even here. Valentine's you know? Day. I'm seeing Valentine's Day stuff pop up. Yeah, there, there's there's Valentine's Day. Like we had, you know, it, it, Halloween came in at some chain stores, and then Christmas came in the week after the Halloween stuff started to show up. Right. You know, and now it's just like this overlap. And you know, you used to think, oh, you know, it wasn't 
about consumer stuff. They were just trying to, but now it's just like soaking every last single time. You know, a little bit of class and restraint. You know, wait, wait, like Have a, a week. little bit of class, Target. <laughs> <laughs> That's Are right. You, do you like the early, early um, merchandising of holidays or? Um, I just shop at the dollar store. So, so every day is Christmas at the dollar store. <laughs> no, it doesn't bother me. I wouldn't say. Okay. Some but, some people. But it bothers Troy. Some people. And I respect don't that. add him. Well, on this. <laughs> One thing that I uh, have to talk about. Um, so there was a um, there's this we got the news that Google or, I'm sorry Amazon is moving headquarters to Arlington Virginia, and part of New York City. Uh, someone posted on Twitter uh, a snippet from the contract between Amazon and Arlington. In the contract, it says that uh, Amazon can leave within five days' notice. The city of Arlington, Virginia, is hooked to this contract until, whatever, 2049. But Amazon can leave in five days' notice. This person clipped this part of the, um, of the contract that's publicly available, put it on Twitter, and said, this is effing ridiculous. He used the F word. Shock and awe, whatever. A, a journalist from Virginia tweeted the person who originally sent out the picture of the contract and said, hey, can you retweet this without using profanity so I can send it to my audience so that my audience can see it? Why wouldn't the journalist just do journalism work and find the contract himself and tweet out the picture on his own? I kind of think this is kind of a state of journalism in 2018 with some people of just, hey, you did the work. Can I retweet it? Well, for that matter, why not you know, take a screen cap just blank out the profanity and do the same thing. I mean, it's, you know, I mean. It's it, a publicly available contract. This guy yeah. could have easily gone online, found the clause, and but he wanted this guy to do the work for him. Yeah, that's. And I'm not going to name who it was, but it's out there on Twitter. It's easy to find. It just, it kind of was weird to me. Like, you're a journalist. Go do the work. Yeah, profanity's never stopped me. <laughs> oh, it has not. No, and, and that, you know, it's a quote, too. Right. So, I mean. You know, I, I don't understand the whole, it's my audience, because there's not going to be a lot of five-year-olds reading about Amazon contracts on online. Twitter. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of a specious argument, really. I mean, you know, if you're worried about your editor coming down on you or whatever, do it, get the story up, and then deal with that later. But right. it's, Or just it, do the legwork, find the contract yourself, and post the picture. Do you worry about your kid using their iPads to look at Amazon <laughs> new stories. On, on, on the sliding <laughs> scale of stuff I'm worried about with my kids, looking at Amazon contracts is not, not one of them. Um, stuff that I wrote in maybe 1999 or 2000 worries me a little bit, but you know. Do you have a donut at me this week? I do. Um, so, I, obviously, the holiday season is coming up, and um, as Troy noted, the stores are filled. And I would just love to just stop it with the gifts. <laughs> Uh, I, I, it seems like, I mean, after a time, adults giving to adults. I don't have children. But after a time, it just seems like you're passing money back and forth. Do you not right. like getting gifts? I don't mind it. Okay, every once in a while you get, you know, you receive or give a gift that you feel is really special and thoughtful. But, but the what's the percentage on that? The twenty dollar gift cards back and forth. I feel that way too. It's like we're just give me twenty bucks and I give you twenty bucks and I'll save myself the space in line at Target. I, I think that holidays would be better spent without this pressure uh, to give gifts, receive them. I mean, we can cook together, we can spend time together, but do we really need to just be passing money back and forth every holiday season? Yeah, I, I find it actually really hard to buy for my parents. Um, and I don't know, you know, how many other people have that particular feeling, but it's like, you know, when you, when you get a certain age and like their hobbies or whatever, so dialed in, you kind of feel like you've bought like all the conceivable right, yeah. permutations before. Right. And, and like, even this year with, with my wife and kids, you know, we kind of talked about it back and forth and I'm like, I came up with like two things, you know, like two possible items. Like one was a book and then something like a collectible thing, you know, I'm like, but that's it. You know, that's all I came up with for myself. I am accepting you know? gifts from anyone. I need a new PlayStation 4. So I'm not on with this millennial trying to... How millennials kill gift giving. I'm not on that train. Um, they will. Do you hate the economy? Do you I hate, hate America? <laughs> <laughs> Nick, where can we find you online? I'm at Darwin Jr. with a Y. 
at Troy Brownfield. You can find me at Wakefield Report, and you can find the Saturday Evening Post everywhere at Saturday Evening Post. And if you don't like seeing our faces, you can also listen to this exact same show as a podcast. We're on Apple, to Apple iTunes, Pitcher Radio, and everywhere else you can find your favorite podcast. If you do listen, subscribe, leave us a five-star rating and review. That's all we have from this week from Metazoid Brewing. We'll see you all next week.